Okay. So, I mean, like uh, we can see it now. So, maybe I will introduce and uh, we start. So, okay. Please, so, yes. um, it, 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 first of all, we welcome all the participants in the morning session of today's. So, we have three speakers today. We have uh, Dr. Shai Vigyanampati uh, and then Professor Anand Kumar Jha, and also we have Dr. Aradhya Shukla. Now, um, I would like to introduce our first speaker today, uh, uh, Dr. Shai Vigyanampati. He is an uh, associate professor in the, in the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay, and he did his PhD from Louisiana State University, and then he was a postdoc in University of Massachusetts, Boston, and then he was also in National University of Singapore, and then you, you, you joined in 2016, I guess? Yes. Okay, okay, that's very nice. And then uh, his present research uh, interests are like quantum information theory, quantum control, quantum thermodynamics, quantum synchronization, and uh, of course, non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. And today he is going to present a very interesting topic, hypothesis testing, I think in classical and quantum systems. I give you Shai. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this kind introduction. And also thank you for the invitation. I've been uh, part of this uh, conference uh, because of, uh, I think, the generous uh, support of uh, our faculty colleagues at uh, ISO Kolkata for, uh, I think, seven, eight years now. So, um, you know, uh, I feel like this is one of my regular parts of my, uh, my semesters. Uh, so with that, let me, uh, let me share with you um, uh, today's talk. So uh, before I tell you the kind of the formal um, uh, uh, title of the talk, uh, I, you know, from years past, I know that, uh, um, uh, you know, we have a fairly mixed audience. We have audience from uh, who are technical experts uh, like Rangit Prasanta and uh, the other speakers here and colleagues from uh, um, various institutes, uh, but we also have students and uh, not just from ICER, uh, but also from around the country and sometimes uh, who have not yet fully taken quantum mechanics courses and such. So in that spirit, I'm going to actually try and uh, tell you in the simplest possible fashion, basically uh, the point of uh, the, the talk, the paper, I will show you the reference for it. Um, uh, and so um, let me show you the motivation or let me share the motivation if you take nothing else away, let me share the motivation to you in these three pictures. So we are building quantum computers, you know, there is activity to build quantum computers around the world and in the country and now we even have a mission that's uh, just come up uh, on the back of basically um, uh, a quest grant that uh, many people here and I uh, were part of. Um, and so the question is, what can you do with these quantum computers, right? There are about 100 qubits, 200, 500 qubits, uh, but they're not error corrected. So you have large num amount of computational capacity, but it's not error corrected um, computation. Can you still do something with it? And there are some interesting suggestions that people have come up with. And the suggestion that uh, essentially we were most inspired by is uh, a suggestion about Ramsey interferometry, uh, which is due to Peter Soller and the paper references here, but I'll actually cite it more carefully later on. Um, and basically what they're saying is they're saying, just don't think of computation. You can, there are any number of interesting tasks that you should think of. And when you think of uh, the set of all such interesting tasks, uh, sometimes quantum, quantum mechanics is useful. And um, sometimes that the way in which quantum mechanics is useful does not require error corrected computation. Um, and hence it's kind of really a very uh, a well suited application for these NISC era quantum computers as they're called. So our uh, paper, uh, which I will present to you today, is basically about uh, hypoxis testing. So hypoxis testing is the task of uh, noticing that uh, you have a blip on a radar and uh, trying to figure out whether the blip is a bird or a, or a plane. So this is the fundamental task of hypoxis testing. Um, so with that, let me uh, uh, bring the title of the slide up. Uh, so I'll talk to you today about um, hypothesis testing. So quantum uh, and classical are the kind of well-known examples, but there is also variational hypothesis testing, which is what we are introducing today. So this is joint work with Mahadevan Subramanian. Um, and so you can find the archive reference here. Um, this is actually, uh, I'm not an expert in, uh, in this area of variational quantum algorithms, which I will present to you. Uh, I'm, I'm still um, somewhat of a student in this. 
Uh, I have two other papers in the field, um, and so I want to just quickly share this with you and also acknowledge the people who uh, have taught me a lot of this stuff. So one uh, is with my colleagues in Singapore. Uh, Kishore Bharati is somebody that you perhaps know. He was uh, uh, in uh, Aisar Mohali. I think he's a speaker in uh, several conferences in the Kolkata Circle, uh, and he's at A-Star in Singapore now. And uh, so this is in press and PRL. And the other is a paper from the year before, um, uh, which is... Uh, also on variational quantum algorithms. So this is applying the question of uh, the exact same question that I asked you, which is what do you do with interesting but non-error corrected quantum computers? So this is about how to do quantum control with them. And this is about how to uh, use um, uh, quantum computers to find non-equilibrium steady states of open quantum systems. So these are the two prior pieces of work, which have informed us quite a lot in, um, in the setup of this, uh, this work. Okay, so uh, these are the folks. So uh, the uh, uh, the quantum control work was done with uh, Guru M. C. Policerla and uh, um, and the um, uh, variational uh, uh, steady states work was done with uh, a group in Singapore. So this is uh, uh, Quek and uh, two PhD students, Jonathan and Kanvi, and Kishore, of course, is I think uh, somewhat well known. And our current work, which is basically the scope of this talk, is uh, uh, Maddie's work, Mahadevan's work. Okay. So with that, let me uh, try and uh, gently start. Again, uh, let me just advertise that feel free to stop me. Actually, almost none of these slides have any any complicated maths. So I'm more than happy to kind of uh, just share intuition and then uh, talk about the maths of it uh, offline. Um, so all of us uh, who've taken a quantum mechanics course or who've studied quantum mechanics have studied this famous uh, problem of uh, what is called the variational principle. Um, it appears uh, mathematically as the variational principle, um, but in uh, quantum mechanics it appears as the problem of trying to estimate the ground state of the helium atom, um, ground state energy of the helium atom. And so there is a uh, there is a variational principle that you can write down. Euler-Lagrange is another example of a variational principle, where what you do is you write uh, a quantity, which is here the ground state energy, as basically uh, the expectation value of some quantum state, which is unknown, and uh, you can normalize the quantum state if it is unnormalized. And by writing this ansatz, what you can do uh, if you've done the uh, classroom exercise is by taking a first order variation, you can check that the first order variation is actually automatically zero and that the correction to the ground state energy, the variation of ground state energy is actually second order, is quadratic. So you get two promises. Promise number one is that the variation energy is larger than the ground state energy. This just comes from the fact that ground state is defined as the minimum overall wave functions, um, the expectation value of the Hamiltonian over all normalized wave functions. And uh, this quadratic uh, uh, piece comes from the fact that the first order variation is set to zero, and that's how you derive basically the Ritz variation principle. So um, if you apply this to the hydrogen atom, if you've never seen this uh, before, if you just do this calculation by hand, so you need some way of uh, uh, an answer for what this psi variation is, uh, in the case of uh, uh, the helium atom, there is a screening parameter, which uh, I won't get into, but that screening parameter is the thing that is minimized and uh, with respect to which the energy is minimized. Uh, you can basically get to about 98% of the correct answer uh, of the ground state of the helium uh, atom. So this is a spectacular achievement for something that involves about 20 minutes of pen and paper work. And uh, so this is the kind of motivating idea here. Um, and, uh, you know, the problem with this idea is that uh, for for many body quantum systems and especially open quantum system quantum systems, these things start becoming more and more complicated. And so just to show you this, uh, I basically want to uh, um, write out basically, I've just borrowed a slide from a, another talk. So um, what I want you to notice is that if I have a system and environment, so some sort of bipartite uh, uh, quantum system, and I want to write the Schrodinger equation for it, the way I would write the Schrodinger equation is to actually take superpositions of vectors which are tensor product with each other. So U tensor V and then with some coefficients I would write that. This is written in some very special notation which is very useful for, um, uh, you know, it's the Schmidt decomposition. It's useful for something that I'm doing downstream. But essentially all I want is this upstairs, these two equations here, which is to say that if I have just the system, I would write superpositions of basis vectors. But because I have a, a bipartite system, a system in an environment, I write something that is basically tensor product in, in its character. And the rest of this has to do with open quantum systems, which is not the point of this talk, so I'll just ignore it. Now, um, how do you take tensor products? So if I have a, a vector which is uh, ket 1, I label it as 1 arbitrarily, 1, 0, and 0 arbitrarily is 0, 1. 
then the tensor product of some, uh, uh, you know, in some tensor product basis, some vector A, which is written as AIJ, IJ, um, is basically uh, given like this. So I A11 is one tensor one. So you just take this and you tensor it with itself and there is some chronicle product formula for it to do it. But what it does is it puts a one upstairs and so on and so forth. So you can fill this out by just looking at this. But what I want you to take away is that if I have only one system, then this is just a two, uh, uh, two by one column matrix. But if I have two of them, it's a four by one column matrix, which means if I have something that is actually an interesting many body quantum system, which has, let's say, 30 atoms, right? It's two to the power of 30, right? Which is quite a large number. Uh, it's a vector, which is two to the power of 30. And I need to be able to hold it on uh, either on a pen and paper or on a computer to then be able to do some sort of minimization, variational optimization, exactly the same way that I did RITS before, right? So that's the computational difficulty of trying to do this um, with uh, on just a pen and paper. That's why uh, you can't take this idea and push it all the way out uh, into generic uh, chemistry problems or many body quantum computing problems. So uh, how do you overcome this? Uh, the, uh, uh, the key intuition basically can be said in one sentence. It's completely trivial almost the, the sentence. Uh, offload the quantum simulations to a NISC device, right? What do you need? You need this quantity, which is some A, and you need to plug it into basically this quantity, which is, you know, see here you put an A, here you put an A, and then the four parameters, A11, A10, A01, and A00, are the parameters that you want to optimize, let's say, to get the ground state energy. So now what you do is you don't do this in, in, in on a pen and paper, which is, of course, very costly, this, just like I said. You just put it on a quantum computer and you simply directly measure these numbers so that you don't actually have to hold any of these numbers, right? Like Feynman uh, taught us famously, um, quantum simulations are actually easily handled by quantum systems. So, you know, so almost that's the intuition here. Uh, offload or delegate uh, the quantum simulation to a, um, to a quantum computer. And maybe if you get lucky, you can do it with a NISC device. It's not guaranteed that a NISC device is good enough to do everything. Uh, you have to now ask whether an S device is good enough to do everything, but and you know, and so maybe you know there is some. We have to look under the hood as to what uh, whether an S device is good for everything. Okay, so with this intuition um, in mind, uh, the uh, the question is how do you how does this circuit work? So what you do is you start the quantum system in some very easy state, and this is a large number. So this is the thirty qubits, for instance, uh, that I previously mentioned. Um, and then what I do is I send these 30 qubits in and then there is something called a parametrized quantum circuit, a PQC. So uh, this review, uh, this is from a review by Kishore Bharti, uh, actually, who's one of the co-authors on these papers. Um, uh, and it's a review of modern physics uh, from uh, 2022. So I, I refer to that if you want a more detailed introduction. Uh, but in summary, what it is, is you just take an easy to prepare state, you send it in, you, you make a, a, a uh, uh, a circuit which basically has parameters theta. So, for instance, these are some rotations, some generic rotations, which are uh, parameterized by theta 1, 1, theta 2, 1, theta 3, 1, so on and so forth. And so the one here refers to the fact that this is the first layer of the circuit and the second and so on and so forth. And then this refers to basically the which qubit you are applying the rotation. To. And then there are some control not operations, whatever. This, it doesn't matter what the details are. But there are a bunch of handles here, u of theta which basically uh, refer to this list theta one, one, theta two, one, so on and so forth, which you can then control. So you apply some, make some choice. It doesn't matter what the choice is. You make some input and you apply some uh, U of theta. And what this does is it produces some parameterized quantum state here. And what you do is you, you apply some basis change. This has some slightly uh, uh, advanced ideas of uh, uh, how to convert Hermitian operators into unitary operators, which I won't uh, get into. Um, so that you can basically perform the, exp you know, apply this Hamiltonian on it, you know, without loss of generality is not a very important thing. Um, and then what you do is when you make measurements, you're actually trying to estimate basically some objective function that you, uh, that you want to uh, optimize over. Then what you do is you take this objective function uh, for the given values and you minimize over theta. So you just run it past a classical computer, which does gradient descent or something like that, or gradient descent. Um, and then uh, you do this feedback loop again and again and again, right? This uh, is not very efficient, which is essentially the, pro the point of our, uh, the paper with Kishore that has just come out. Um, but having said that, let's just move on with this idea. Um, we can do better than this, which is the point of that paper. Um, okay, 
So now why should you care about this approach of solving problems, right? So this approach of solving problems basically says, instead of trying to, for instance, find the ground state of the helium atom, um, take uh, some ansatz of the helium atom, let's say you put it on qubits and you think of the helium atom as composed of, you know, effectively composed of an n qubit um, uh, wave function. And then you do all of this and then you run an optimizer in the bottom, you know, and construct a Hamiltonian which represents the helium atom quite uh, faithfully. And then at the end of the day, you actually can get the ground state energy of the helium atom. You can just say, well, why do I care about this? This sounds extremely esoteric. It sounds extremely uh, specific to some toy problem. Why do I care about this? And it turns out that actually we should all care about it, uh, uh, perhaps because it has, uh, of course, there are very foundational uh, and interesting questions from a physics point of view, which I wouldn't have to um, at all basically make a case for here. Uh, but even if you are um, only interested in applications, um, you know, there is a, quite a lot to do here. Uh, so combinatorial optimization problems, as Ed Farhi uh, and uh, colleagues uh, pointed out, are actually amenable to this kind of optimization. So an example of a variation quantum algorithm is something called a quantum approximate op optimization algorithm. And this QAOA is basically um, uh, uh, is uh, something that is quite amenable to um, uh, solving some very interesting uh, uh, problems in finance and so on and so forth, all kinds of combinatorial optimization. So people in across a variety of inter industries are actually quite interested in this. Okay, so more closer to physics, uh, our quantum chemistry colleagues are actually quite interested in this. And in fact, uh, this paper on the right hand side actually shows you, uh, um, uh, it's a hydrogen um, uh, uh, ion, I'll show you the actual diagram in a, se in a second. Um, and this is the um, this is the variation. This is the energy of it as a as atomic bond separation uh, using a quantum computer. And so, what is in red is basically the actual calculated value, and uh, and what is uh, uh, what is in uh, in these dotted uh, uh, points is basically the experimental value from a photonic quantum computer, which was actually implemented by uh, this paper, uh, Alberto Peruzzo et al. Um, and so what these uh, uh, um, authors pointed out for the first time was that you could actually realistically try and do things like drug design basically on uh, quantum computers. This is a very modest molecule, I, sh I, should, I should warn uh, myself when I say so, things like this. But nonetheless, the scope is there that, you know, perhaps if we carefully uh, look at this um, and, you know, and tweak all the parameters and optimize it, uh, to its fullest extent, and maybe if you go out to 500 qubits or something, there is something there which we can use uh, for real industrial applications. So uh, the why we should care about VQA is this is the this is the this is my pitch to you. Um, and in this context, I want to point out um, another application which is basically uh, programmable quantum sensors. So. Uh, this is the full um, uh, reference. Um, so uh, uh, Peter Soller is on this uh, on this list of uh, co-authors here. Um, and so what they pointed out was they said, look, uh, conventional Ramsey interferometry is basically where you take a bunch of ions and then you entangle them into a noon state, right? So all down plus all up. And then you perform basically a phase uh, acquisition step. So where what you do is you acquire the phase, but all the, uh, the phases that are acquired either all of them will acquire the up or all of them will acquire the down. So it's as if uh, you have some quantum superposition where everything either gets kicked to the left or kicked to the right, which produces a very sharp difference because you have twice as many kicks uh, if you have twice as many atoms. And so you see a very sharp difference. You can quantify all of this mathematically. And then you can basically measure in some correct basis and you can extract this information out. What uh, um, uh, Peter Solis uh, uh, and colleagues pointed out was that they said this optimum state, which is the noon state, is actually only optimum if basically what you get is a phase from one, uh, just a single unknown phase. So if this phase phi is drawn from a delta function distribution, so there's just one unknown phase and you have to figure out what that unknown phase is. If the phase is actually drawn from some probability distribution, then uh, it's no longer the case that uh, this is the optimum. In fact, the op optimum is not known. It's not straightforward. And so by using some uh, uh, mean square estimators and uh, Bayesian optimization so on and so forth, they basically make the case that variational quantum algorithms can actually solve this problem. So this, they show that this can be done. And so, um, uh, and so in this context, basically, we wanted to ask, uh, can we solve the problem? Uh, can we find another application which is outside of programmable quantum sensors, which is adjacent to programmable quantum sensors, uh, which would also find wide appeal and application 
um, in the community. So our solution is basically um, uh, hypothesis testing, or rather our question is hypothesis testing. So again, uh, um, I apologize to the experts in the audience. Uh, uh, this is uh, for some of our younger colleagues. So the question of hypothesis testing um, is actually quite straightforward, which is, let's say I have a microphone over here and I have bells, which are basically either in location one, location two, or location three. By listening to the ring from the bell, um, you can actually either by looking at the intensity uh, of the uh, of the received audio signal, if you know that they're all being struck with the same amplitude, um, you can infer basically how far they were. Uh, maybe if you know at what time they went off by simply noticing the delay to you, you can figure out where they were, right? So you are often asked to answer these kinds of questions, which is, was it bell number one, bell number two, or bell number three, right? So this is a question where basically there are multiple choices presented to you and you have to pick one of the multiple choices, right? And so um, this is actually uh, uh, um, uh, an interesting problem. You can think, you can see that this is a very primitive problem and it appears all the time uh, in all kinds of uh, places. You know, I'll show you some very specific examples. So, uh, you know, in an ideal world, you would have only two choices. The two choices would be either the bell goes off and in which case, basically, um, you know, the, the mic hears the bell and then the mic says, yes, the bell was struck or uh, and, hence, uh, and hence negates this option or the bell doesn't go off and then the other choice is picked. But um, in real life, you can imagine that um, you know the source of uh, the signal and the detector of the signal do not enjoy such a clean and ideal relationship. Um, so what you instead enjoy is something like this. What you instead have to suffer is something like this. So I've picked a very different uh, uh, application from a very different part of the um, uh, um, part of the scientific experience, which is basically. Uh, uh, detecting basically gravitational waves on uh, LIGO detectors. So this is the two detectors, one at Hanford and one at Livingston. The only dramatic piece of information I want you to notice here is that, you know, this is a very jiggly line and you have to figure out from this kind of very um, unusual pattern, whether there was a black hole, you know, merger or a neutron star merger or whatever the event is that they're studying, whether this actually happened or not. Um, so the central point I want to make to you is that the signals actually look more complicated. So looking at a very complicated signal, you have to somehow backtrack basically whether or not the object exists. And this is the kind of more complicated setting of hypothesis testing, uh, which is interesting and also will directly have uh, real life applications, right? Um, so now I'm getting slowly more into the maths of things. So in the realm of hypothesis testing, um, you know, there is, uh, there is this kind of chart, which is always presented, this binary choices chart. So uh, the actual value of the hypothesis, whether it is actually true or actually false, um, has to be uh, positioned against basically the predicted value after you make a bunch of measurements. So this uh, positive basically means, yes, there was a neutron star which collided with a neutron star in spiral or whatever. Um, and uh, negative means no, no such event happened, no such you know, uh, uh, gravitating bodies with uh, commensurate sizes were uh, present in the neighborhood. Um, and uh, now LIGO as a detector has to say, uh, yes, uh, the event happened or no, the event did not happen. And so uh, what you want is positive, positive and negative, negative to be, um, to be highly favored. And you want basically these two to be disfavored, right? So this is uh, negative positives are false negative. So even though the actual thing is true, what you've registered is a negative and uh, positive negatives are false positives, right? And false negatives and false positives do not always have the same, uh, um, uh, they're not equivalent, right? So suppose think of COVID as a, um, as a um, um, uh, think, of, think of the COVID era that we, you know, that we're still in, but you know, the peak of which, uh, or the most severe unknown bits of which uh, we just passed a couple of years ago. Um, as the uh, as the disease progressed, we basically developed a bunch of different tests, civilizations, uh, you know, countries around the world. And uh, so there were these RAT tests, rapid antigen tests, and then there were the more RT-PCR based, you know, more uh, carefully done tests. And the question that you always wanted to ask was, uh, you know, uh, well, what happens when my test is not correct, right? You actually don't care in the case of COVID, whether if there is an, a, a, a patient who's actually healthy, uh, who registers to be positive because you know it, it's a life-threatening pandemic it's it, it put, unfortunately has cost uh, all of us very dearly and so in this case uh, we take as a kind of, you know as, as societies we take the hit that you know maybe i stay at home for five days and it's not the 
end of the world for me, especially if social services provides uh, the adequate support. So we don't much care about this false positive, right? So if a rat test comes out and it actually every once in a while just says uh, yes to actual negative number or negative cases, we don't care about this. We care very deeply about this case, which is false negatives, because if an actual COVID positive patient is reintroduced into society, then they go on to infect more people. So these two things are not necessarily always uh, have symmetric weight. It depends on what you're testing, what the underlying hypothesis is. Um, and so uh, and so in that case, basically, uh, there are there are other examples of pregnancy, for instance, where, you know, maybe it's the exact other way around. Right? So um, I just want to highlight for those who don't know, uh, who, who are new to this field, that this entire area, even in classical uh, statistics, is a very fascinating study and, and you know, and uh, more or less, this is the basis on which we've done things like COVID testing over the last two years, uh, over the last three, four years. Um, okay, so uh, what's the uh, classical intuition? So there are many kind of well-known theorems in the field, uh, and so I wanted to present just one before I get on with kind of the formal results of my talk. Um, and the class, uh, and this uh, as intuition, I wanted to share with you in case you know uh, the actual content of the talk is, uh, is not very interesting to you. And the classical intuition basically can be summarized in any different number of ways. Maybe Hofting was the better thing to discuss here, but let me discuss Chebyshev's inequality. So basically what it says is that if you have a Gaussian probability distribution, let's say the probability distribution is that of height of uh, men in the Powai area where I am right now in Bombay. Um, so if the real mean, the true mean of the sample is, is over here, this dotted line, uh, and you measure, uh, um, you know, a large enough number of people, then basically what happens is that the probability that uh, X, the measured mean minus the actual mean is larger than K times basically the variance is, uh, is suppressed by one over K squared. So if K is two, it's suppressed by one fourth. If K is three, it's suppressed by one ninth. So so what this basically means is that, you know, suppose you go out and you take two people, right? Well, uh, one of them may be unusually tall for Indians, um, you know, but if you pick three, four more people, you know, maybe you find another person who's slightly shorter than the mean, but you know, this giant here is an, is an extremely unlikely event, right? So, you know, if you are seven feet tall in India, right? I mean, you're a celebrity, you're practically a celebrity. So that's all that this thing says. It says it's highly unusual if the actual samples you know, asymptotic mean is basically some value mu. It's actually highly unusual for you to make, let's say, 50 measurements or 100 measurements, and then uh, basically find the mean to have deviated too, too much from the actual mean, right? And um, if you want an inequality which basically has the number of times that you measured in it, then there are some cousins. This Hofting's inequality, which basically gets you to the same score, right? So this is all that the intuition is. So it says, you know, um, uh, by using this intuition, what it says is you can test uh, a hypothesis. So if your hypothesis is that the average height of Indians is that dotted line there, you can test it by simply taking 10 measurements or 20 measurements or 30 measurements. And the moment you hit the 30th measurement, you basically more or less know the answer. Right? Okay, so, um, and this is basically another version of this or another cousin of this is basically um, this, you know, one sigma, two sigma conversation we often have um, in statistics, which I just wanted to just highlight. Okay. So getting now more towards the mathematical theory. So how do I think of this as a, a, in real life? In real life, what I do is I have a probability distribution uh, function or a histogram, which I gen which is the data that I generate. So I want you to think of these kind of histograms as the data that I generate. And I have two hypotheses, or maybe I have one hypothesis and I have to say whether it fits the hypothesis or not, right? So, um, you know, so just for your convenience, I've given you two hypotheses here. One is the blue line underneath. And then another one's like a slightly wonky red line, right? And you can see that the slightly wonky red line underperforms with respect to the blue line in some places, you know, slightly over the blue line in other places. Uh, and the histogram is also doing something, right? And basically where the histogram massively disagrees with the hypothesis, both hypotheses kind of disagree with it, right? And they're actually equal. I made them exactly equal. So this is not very straightforward. It's not very straightforward to be able to tell um, you know, whether what you have underneath, you know, you know so th these are basically uh, uh, the test results that you get from, you know, from looking at various aspects of a test. And now the hypothesis uh, one is basically uh, that the person um, uh, is uh, COVID positive and symptomatic. Hypothesis two is COVID positive and asymptomatic. And hypothesis 
the always the null hypothesis is none of the above, right? Basically, so the neither uh, of these things is, is the case. Okay, so from here on out, I'm actually now going to transition into my talk. Um, and uh, so now let me just say that there are important choices that you have to make uh, in the case of hypothesis testing. So one is whether you want to discuss classical hypothesis testing or quantum hypothesis testing. Obviously, we're in a quantum computing conference, so I'm going to go for the quantum hypothesis testing. So the classical hypothesis testing is you measure some voltage uh, on a voltmeter, and now you have to decide whether the resistance is R1 or not R1, right? Some, you know, this is the hypothesis that you may be testing. On the other hand, the quantum hypothesis test basically proceeds roughly as follows. There is some quantum state psi, and it comes out of two, it's either psi1 or psi2. Those are the two hypotheses I may be testing. And then I perform some measurement, but the measurement, you know, can be uh, can register either zero or one. So if it's a qubit, it can be either spin up or spin down. Uh, if it's a, a three-level atom, it can be minus one, zero, plus one, so on and so forth. If um, it's a harmonic oscillator, it can register anywhere on the uh, you know on the Fock basis. And depending on basically uh, the probability of the outcome of this uh, measurement out of this measurement outcome, the probability, the statistical outcome, basically which is basically given by psi times uh, m dagger m times psi. Uh, this probability basically allows me to infer uh, whether or not um, uh, uh, the I should choose hypothesis one or hypothesis two, right? So I have to I have to infer from this whether I want to lean on hypothesis one or hypothesis two. Right? So um, instead of this, uh, what I will present to you is actually a slightly different uh, cousin of this which is that I have a density matrix that I input, which uh, uh, was in one of the slides before. And the density matrix basically, uh, or quantum state actually, there's nothing too specific about this to be density matrices, quantum state that I input. And then what I do is I uh, basically have a, uh, have a channel that is applied to it. And the channel uh, is either channel one or channel two. And, and a channel uh, for those who uh, might not be aware, it's just a CPTP map. Um, and uh, so what you get out is basically two output states, row one and row two, which are basically the uh, consequences of applying uh, a channel epsilon or E1 or E2 on a density matrix row. So this is uh, the hypothesis testing setup that I want to choose. So I choose quantum hypothesis testing, which means that my uh, output uh, um, uh, are quantum states and the two hypotheses are embedded into the structure of the quantum states that, I, uh, that I, I'm now free to measure whichever way I want and I have to extract this back. Uh, there is another important choice in the universe of hypothesis testing, which is, uh, am I only allowed to measure once or am I allowed to measure multiple passes? So if I'm only allowed to measure once, this is a little bit like looking at the Yeti, you know, so I'm, I'm out in the woods, I have a camera in my pocket, I see something funny or the Loch Ness Monster, so I pull out my camera and take a picture. Um, and so I just am allowed one use before the monster disappears and that's it. So I have a plane that's zipping by and I get limited radar um, activity on my radar. So this is basically what's called the one shot um, uh, regime. Um, and this is to be contrasted against basically uh, um, a different uh, variety, which is I just give you the, uh, the, the um, you know, access to the hypothesis. You can, you can query it as many times as you want and you need to tell me whether uh, the hypothesis is hypothesis one or hypothesis two. So here, for instance, it's as if I give you a glass plate of unknown thickness, but the unknown thickness is, uh, it's either, you know, it's either flint glass or not, and you need to tell me whether it's flint glass or not. So those are the two hypotheses, and you can, you, you can do whatever you want with it. So um, in, uh, in particular, what I want to highlight is, about, is basically I'm allowed to batch process these things. So I can do a different variety of things which I've en encoded in the different dotted lines and, you know, embedding structures here. So I can use basically, I can use a batch, which is in this dotted line, and the batch could consist of doing this 20 times. I've indicated two, but you know, 20 times. And then I could take this 20 times and repeat it over and over and over again. I could do a batch processing and then many batches of the batch processing. Maybe that's an interesting thing for me to do. I could do a batch processing and then learn something from it and adapt my strategy and do another batch processing. So this is basically um, uh, uh, called, uh, an adaptive strategy, right? And this adaptive strategy is also something that I can do. I could parallelly basically choose uh, many, many, many multiple copies of uh, the hypothesis, the CPTP map, and then I could stick in quantum states, get them all through this, um, and maybe even have entanglement between them and then test something on the other end. So these are the multiple pass uh, scenarios which we have to consider, right? And so um, in this, uh, with all of these, there is another important choice. 
So uh, let me just highlight because I'm, I'm uh, making many important choices. So important choice number one is whether I choose classical or quantum. Important choice number two is do I get one shot at the hypothesis or many shots at the hypothesis? So I'm choosing quantum and, the, and so the hypothesis is embedded in some little fiber optic cable that, through which my light goes and the fiber optic cable has some description and I need you to tell me which variety of description uh, is more appropriate. Um, and the second choice is basically uh, whether I get one pass through the fiber optic cable or whether I get multiple passes through multiple fiber optic cables and uh, all of which are obeying one of the two hypotheses. Um, and the third choice is basically what do I want to minimize? Do I care more about false positives? Do I care more about false negatives? Do I care about the sum of these two? Right? And so this is a very interesting, uh, this is a very impressive joke that I once saw in a statistics book that I want to share with you. Um, and so let me now present to you some uh, known results, basically. So <coughs> the known results, sorry, there should be a reference here. <coughs> um, I think it should be on another of the slides again, um, uh, Frankfurt Strate and a bunch of people. Um, so the error probability um, of basically mistaking one for the other, hypothesis one for hypothesis two, this is the important thing that we are interested in. In the case where the choice that I make is quantum states and channels, plus I want to uh, uh, minimize what is called the total error, which is uh, uh, type one plus type two divided by two, plus I only get one shot at the channel. So this error probability is basically given by one half minus the diamond norm between the two CPTP maps divided by four. So this diamond norm is some object here, which is basically just uh, what happens when you maximize the trace distance between the application of the quantum channel along with an ancillary uh, um, uh, mode on an entangled channel in a higher dimensional space um, and basically uh, epsilon zero and epsilon one it should uh, it should say here sorry epsilon zero and epsilon one and so this uh, when you maximize over all possible density matrices you basically get the diamond norm and this diamond norm is exactly basically the um, uh, the related to the error probability right so when you want to minimize this you want to minimize this and so um, uh, you want to maximize this sorry um, and so uh, the other setup that i'm going to the other change to the setup so you know let me just go so notice here that i had just given an input state and then it just went in right but maybe there are bad input states maybe if i send in a maximally mixed state maybe nothing happens right so maybe there are good states and bad states to account for good states and bad states another thing that i do is i also send in the uh, a fixed initial state, which I will choose somehow, um, and then a unitary uh, matrix, which embeds basically a parameter theta, and then this row theta, I send it in, and then I maximize the trace distance between them, which is the same as doing this. So this procedure produces a trace distance, and I will show you some trace distance pictures. So when you look at trace distance, what I want you to think of is this is the case where, of course, quantum, but this is total error probability and one shot um, is the scenario that is being considered. Uh, another scenario that you can consider is total, but you can do whatever you want. You can just do parallel processing on this. And this basically uh, is given, the error probability is given, uh, is exponentially suppressed in the number of uh, attempts that you make. And uh, it's exponentially suppressed as minus n times what's called the, um, uh, 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 this quantity uh, zeta, um, uh, xi, sorry, xi, um, and uh, what's called the quantum Chernoff bound. And this quantum churn of bound has some clunky formula, which I don't want to get into right now. But uh, essentially, I will show you some churn of bound pick, uh, um, uh, diagrams as well. And when I show you this, what I want you to understand is that I'm talking about the case where I'm talking about quantum hypothesis testing, total error probability is being minimized, and then I'm interested only in the asymptotic scenario, right? Because these are two actually very different scenarios. And an unrelated to hypothesis testing question, well, it's actually not super unrelated, it is related, um, is the curvature of probability distribution functions. So if I take the, uh, the quantum relative entropy, this is a technical point, I apologize if I'm losing some of the uh, uh, students here. If I take the quantum relative entropy between neighboring quantum states, which are parameterized by some theta, it's approximately the Fisher information times d theta squared. And so if I take this Fisher information, which is, you know, which is given in this formula, the variance of an unbiased estimator, this is var phi, has nothing to do with another phi which is coming up. So this is a different phi. So the variance of an unbiased estimator is actually given by one over the square root of the Fisher information. So if I have large Fisher information, I have low error. And this is basically 
um, uh, another piece of uh, uh, data that I will show you um, uh, in, in, in the coming minutes. Okay, I should speed up. Okay, so with all of this, let me go back and, and, and uh, revisit uh, Kishore's um, uh, um, figure one from Kishore's uh, paper. So this parametrized quantum circuit, um, um, uh, so you start with a fiducial state, so rho in is just all zeros. You uh, use a parametrized quantum circuit to basically, uh, um, you know, fine tune your initial state. And then you do something here, which basically makes sure that you do the measurement that you're, you set up the measurement that you're interested in. And then you measure in some fixed places. And then you take the output and then you run it through a classical optimizer, basically. And if you do this, then uh, you can basically get the um, thing that you're interested in. So this is just a cartoon of the minimization program uh, of the chemical molecule that I showed you a second ago. Okay, so what is our proposal with all of this? Let me uh, take the last maybe five minutes or so before I take questions. Um, let me uh, talk a little bit about what our proposal is. Our proposal is the following, which is I have uh, two registers. One of these registers um, starts in zero and it's an n qubit register. And then there is a parametrized quantum circuit which entangles it with another register um, uh, Q2, which is equal, si equal in size. And then I retain this register, but this register I send through the unknown CPTP map. So this is the hypothesis testing uh, part here. So the unknown CPTP map acts on it. And when they come back, what I do is um, I push them through basically a parametrized quantum circuit, V5 with another ancillary Q, which I hold, to my, hold with myself, which actually measures basically the, um, uh, uh, which actually, uh, parameterizes the measurement and only this is measured this this one qubit that you hold on together is measured basically so what this basically means is that um, uh, is that this binary measurement uh, um, uh, p0 or p1 i'll tell you why the binary measurement is there uh, essentially implements a variational version of uh, computing the trace uh, uh, distance between two quantum states and so um, here what you get is basically you get an initial state which is prepared over here it goes through an unknown quantum channel, but you retain part of it, and then the retained part you mix with some uh, with some parametrized quantum circuit, which pre prepares a measurement, and then you only measure a, a very easy bit of it, and then by using all of this, you can uh, uh, you can compute something called the variational trace uh, distance, which is basically given in this formula. So it's rho zero minus rho one, but parametrized by theta, and if theta uh, can be chosen um, appropriately, so if it's an expressible answer uh, in the VQA language, then um, uh, it's guaranteed that if you fine tune theta, then you will actually get to the actual trace distance. So all these bounds are worked out in the in the paper. Okay, so there is um, one little bit of this circuit which I need to explain to you before I show you the results, which is basically that uh, you this little piece which is color coded now in yellow. It's the exact same diagram as before. I've just highlighted some of it in in this. Uh, in, uh, I guess, in orange. Um, what this little piece represents is actually a Neimark uh, uh, dilation for those who know what that means. So any uh, um, uh, POBM with uh, I outcomes, basically gamma I, uh, can be implemented with uh, um, an ancillary mode I and then a unitary transformation. So this V of phi acts as the unitary transformation, so you can see it here. And then the uh, and this is a two outcome POVM, which means that it's gamma or one minus gamma. So the I is just you know, is just zero. That's the reason why we we're able to just set this to zero. And this two outcome POVM basically uh, accounts for the nine. Uh, you know, so this way of doing the parameterized quantum circuit uh, represents what's called the Neimark dilation of the uh, of the measurement optimization, right? So this is just a technical point again that I want to uh, that I want to say so all that it says in simple words let me say what I'm what I'm trying to say what I'm trying to say is I have these quantum states that are going in I'm optimizing a little bit of it and then I'm putting them through CPTP maps then when I come here I need to do a good measurement now how do I know that I have a good measurement I first need to set up theoretically that this measurement is good enough to capture all good measurements that's what the Neimark dilation does then I have to tell you that um, the parameters here are enough to measure to actually um, uh, well I have to make some comment about whether the parameters are enough to uh, find that measurement and this is the expressibility of VFI and uh, in the paper what we show is that if VFI is expressible for suboptimal uh, u theta you still hit the optimal trace distance for that u theta and now if u of theta is also expressible then the double optimization gives you the 
two trace distance. So this is provable, it's quite straightforward. So all this is actually uh, in the thing, but for uh, in simple English, what I want to tell you is basically, uh, there is essentially this double optimization, which should worry you a little bit, which is, I don't know what I'm, what I'm looking for, epsilon zero one. one. So I shine some light, maybe there are good flashlights and bad flashlights. So I shine light and I have an optimizer which optimizes over the light, but I also am optimizing over my own eyes, right? This is the measurement end of it. So essentially, I don't know what I'm shining and I don't know what I'm measuring. And this sounds like a little bit of a trap, but, and essentially this is to reassure you that there is enough machinery here to kind of get out of that trap. Okay. So uh, how do we, you know, okay, so that's the setup. So how do we know that this thing actually works, right? Um, and uh, so, you know, there is actually a well-known case of quantum hypothesis testing. It's a very famous case from 2007, 2008, um, which um, would you I don't mean, like, uh, be able to kind of uh, complete in five minutes so that I mean, like, uh, absolutely. No, no, I'm almost done. Uh, yeah, I'm almost done. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, the gold standard example is basically what's called Gaussian quantum illumination. So this is uh, a quantum illumination problem where you send uh, um, some light and uh, an entangled pair of uh, photons, um, uh, an entangled quantum state. And then what happens is that it's very heavily mixed with a beam splitter. And either the beam splitter has, uh, has uh, um, the beam splitter parameter eta equals zero, which means that there is, uh, there is no beam splitter and all you get is just the raw thermal uh, noise or it has some reflectivity and basically uh, you get the thermal large amount of thermal noise mixed in with a little bit of quantum light and uh, this eta just so that you can see is parameterized here it's it's something it's just a beam splitter it's not anything to worry about the central point i want to make is that when you uh, here when you perform the collect measurement like some coincidence measurement there is a well known optimum state which basically uh, uh, tells you the optimum value of all of them, all of these numbers that I just told you about, which is, you know, um, the trace distance and the churn off bound, which are the single shot and asymptotic case of the hypothesis test, uh, are both saturated in this case, they're provably saturated for fixed uh, average number of photons, which is given by science hyperbolic squared of this parameter, which goes into this uh, quantum state. This quantum state is a famous quantum state called the two mode squeeze vacuum. So this is my result slide, uh, Rangit, so I'm almost done. I'm just going to wrap up. Um, so with this, let me just, you know, with all this machinery that I've set up, let me just throw the result at you. So what I've shown, what I'm showing you is what our optimizer can do. Um, when you increase the number of bath photons, so this is the bath getting noisier and noisier, NB is just the amount of thermal radiation coming in through here. Um, and uh, what I'm plotting on this axis is the, uh, is the trace distance. So this is, I want to do a hypothesis test and I want to do it uh, in the single shot scenario, can you tell me what is the best quantum state if I restrict myself to some number of photons, let's say 0 0.1 photons, and the restricted answer is basically given by the two mode squeeze vacuum, which is that dotted line there, uh, which is that solid line, that black line. All of these points here, what these points represent is the variational optimization that we've done. So at this value of NB, we've optimized and we found this. If you actually calculate its true trace distance, remember that this is our estimated trace distance, if you calculate the true trace distance, you can see that the true trace distance is much closer to the actual, right? And we are actually hugging the optimal line quite straightforwardly. And this is basically some um, benchmark against basically the gold standard uh, uh, hypothesis testing problem that exists. Again, you can ask not this question, which is a single shot question. You can ask the question for uh, asymptotics case, which is the churn off bound case. And this is the thing. Again, you can see we're hugging the line. Again, we, we've given this, uh, um, uh, you know, this optimizer some freedom, you know, and, and it's just found these. Uh, uh, here we are asking, is it a good uh, metrological sensor? Um, you know, we've optimized for other things, but is it actually a good metrological sensor and actually finds the optimum? It turns out to be that it's the optimum there as well. And the central point about all of this is that uh, its fidelity to the two mode squeeze vacuum is quite high, but not high enough. So um, there are states here with 96% fidelity, where the, um, the let's say the 10 dominant uh, um, numbers in the Schmidt decomposition are actually very different. So they're not LOCC invariant. Um, and so this is finding genuinely different uh, quantum states in a manifold of quantum states, which are actually useful for this kind of optimization problem. So this is basically the bottom line. Uh, we also were able to show that there is some noise resilience to the problem. So as you increase the amount of gate error, so this is the question of, 
you know, okay, you've shown me something for a good quantum computer, but this, uh, we all agree that we have noisy quantum computers. So make a model of the noise and show me that for the model of the noise, this thing does well enough. And, you know, for modest amounts of error, we are still okay. It's a, it's a very, it's a very modest result. Um, and this is the last uh, penultimate slide before I show you the conclusion. So what we are basically asking here is we're asking what does single shot mean, right? What does the word single shot mean? Because uh, remember what a variational uh, algorithm does, right? So I have to take some quantum states and I have to run the optimizer again and again and again. What do I mean I only get to use it once? So this is what uh, this, this slide is trying to answer that question. So um, I am going to take my quantum radar right out into the sky because I'm suspecting that I have an enemy that I need to detect. So what I do is in-house, I take uh, the number of bath photons and uh, at some value, let's say one, and I take the number of uh, reflectivity at 10 to the minus three. I really don't know where the where the enemy is. Uh, and I optimize my quantum state, my variational quantum state for that. And I take it and deploy it into, into the field. And what this is showing you is the trace distance that you actually get. And it's actually pretty good. Just look at the scale. All, you, all I want you to notice is the scale only deviates from one in the third decimal place, right? So it, it does pretty, pretty well, right? In the, at least in this kind of small numerical range that we found. Likewise, the Chernoff one. Doesn't matter if you're using it for single shot or asymptotics, our states are actually uh, pretty decent. Okay, um, and are the results generic? Yes, they are. We also tested for various qubit channels and you get very good results there as well. I'll just skip over this slide uh, just for um, uh, uh, brevity. So let me conclude by basically showing you the four pictures again, instead of actually showing you any uh, detailed pros. So um, what I told you was that uh, variational quantum algorithms and this kind of NISC error that we're in is very, very good for certain variety of problems. For instance, combinatorial optimization, you know, which Sid, for instance, who spoke yesterday uh, from IIT Bombay does. Um, it's also good for kind of uh, quantum chemistry optimization problems. And here is the example that I uh, promised you. So it's a hydrogen helium molecule um, that they found the uh, uh, ground state for. Um, and, uh, you know, recently, uh, um, uh, Peter Soller's group basically showed that if you have, an, uh, if you have a kind of slightly different uh, quantum metrology uh, protocol, then these programmable quantum sensors are able to lock in and estimate uh, basically the unknown parameter. Um, and uh, now what we are presenting to you is uh, essentially one more application, which I think is a good application and hopefully uh, will be uh, um, uh, the point of future studies, which is that this is very, very good for hypothesis testing. Um, so that's the uh, that's the um, uh, conclusion. Uh, I thank you very much for your time and patience. So this is my co-author Maddie, um, and I'm happy to take questions. Shai, uh, thank you very much. I mean, this, this is very nice. And it's beautiful, and uh, you, you gave a really very nice overview and also presented your work. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Yeah. So we have some questions, I think. Uh, uh, shall we take some questions? I yes, please. Yes. I see one raise hand, raised hand from Shamgeet. Uh, yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. OK. Uh, so in the quantum uh, hypothesis testing uh, for the one shot case, uh, so uh, you uh, can we think of the minimum error discrimination problem as an example for this? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're all related to health from bounds and so on and so forth, if that's you know, where you're coming from. Okay, well, yeah, yeah. Uh, also, one more thing, like uh, what happens if we have like, uh, you know, uh, so basically you said uh, we, we apply this uh, quantum channel first, right? Or to the density operator. Yes. So, yes, so what if, what if there are, yeah. Uh, okay. uh, yeah, yeah, in this one. Uh, what if uh, this e the the quantum channel has more than two outcomes? Like uh, yeah, then you have an outcome P O V M, and you have to just repeat this conversation. So, so basically, uh, uh, wouldn't we have to account for more uh, unfavorable outcomes? Like uh, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. I haven't I haven't seen that study, Sangeet. Um, every time every time we've made a discussion, we you know. I think basically the, the the argument is you know it's it's a straightforward generalization. But let me also confess I've never actually looked directly at a paper that does this. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. 
So if there are some subtleties I'm missing, I apologize. Yeah, yeah it's fine. Thank you. Um, any other question from audience? Okay. Uh, Shai, I have a quick question, if you don't mind. I mean, it's, a, it's like this that uh, long back when uh, we were looking at the measurement problem, actually the von Neumann formulation of measurement problem. So it was like uh, he associated one pointer state to the each targeted measurement state. So suppose I'm measuring, I have a system measuring some observable and uh, the eigenstate, I mean, the corresponding eigenstates of the observables are like a phi, phi one, phi two, phi three. And then suppose I have an apparatus uh, which has a corresponding uh, apparatus states like A1, A2, A3. So mm -hmm. von Neumann showed a very interesting result that you can construct an Hamiltonian which will give you an entangled state like phi1, A1, phi2, A2, phi3, uh, A3. So if you, if you do a measurement on the apparatus, then the system collapses to one of the phi1, phi2. Mm -hmm. so, and, and that way you do not have the cross term. So you do not have phi1, A2 or phi2, mm -hmm. A1. So that kind of uh, was, uh, I was trying to associate that with the, um, um, the result that you were showing that uh, the false positive or true negative, the cross terms, the cross terms, you, you were trying to avoid cross term, right? If, you, like, if you, you have a problem on your yeah, states, then this is true. Right, right. Then you can always construct a Hamiltonian which entangles the. Right, right. Uh, right, right, right. But the moment you don't have, suppose you want to discriminate zero from mm -hmm. plus. Then it's never true that you you know you will there is a, you're always going to get a detector click at zero, which tells you right, nothing. Right. Basically, so the detector click at one okay. is more important yeah, that's right. there, and this is more or less the beginning of this conversation. So here there are mixed states because the uh, the uh, epsilon zero one Absolutely. in the quantum Absolutely. Gaussian quantum elimination case is a very heavily thermally mixing uh, beam splitting uh, beam splitter map. Um, and so uh, there are very heavy mixed states here, which means that uh, they're very non-orthogonal with each other. So there are tons of measurement outcomes, which actually don't give you all the information that you're looking for. So what the, that's one thing, uh, Rangit, I just want to say uh, on a side note, unrelated to this talk, hmm. actually um, that measurement scheme that you just mentioned um, is actually thermodynamically inconsistent. And so if you want to make it thermodynamically consistent, there's more interesting things that come out, which right. I'm happy to tell right. you about. Right. We actually have a paper on the archive. Oh. We will we'll discuss yeah. that. We will discuss that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Maybe, maybe after this. But we have uh, one more raised hand um, from uh, Ranjit Singh. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I have uh, two questions. So, first one is: uh, Can you show form of the Hamiltonian? and observables which you are studying, or maybe I can uh, read somewhere. Uh, so the closest that it comes to, so let me just say what the game here is, uh, uh, Ranjit. Um, so the game here is basically to make sure that uh, the claims that we make are made for any arbitrary CPTP map and any quantum state that uh, has a parametrized uh, uh, circuit that you can use to prepare it with. So uh, I understand the discomfort that you perhaps are expressing, you know, or at least that perhaps I'm feeling, which is where's the Hamiltonian, right? And so uh, there isn't one, but it, this is for good reason, basically, because this is a quantum computing setup where you basically have a, you know, just all zeros, and then you prepare a quantum circuit, which prepares an interesting state. Then you put it through basically other unitaries which simulate a Hamiltonian, bits of a Hamiltonian. So this is called either block encoding or LCU. I can tell you more about it offline. And then you make some measurements which effectively tell you the measurement that you're interested in. So you can, uh, uh, you know, to gain confidence that this thing is not a crazy process, we can actually do the Ritz variation principle this way. And, and you can see, in fact, that's what Alana Spragusic's paper that I mentioned, the chemistry optimization does but uh, also to kind of satisfy you in the moment here is actually um, something that we're benchmarking against so here everything is written out what the cptp map is it's a trace over uh, the system of some unitary which is a beam splitter unitary uh, with uh, the bath photons which are basically thermal bath photons and the system and the idler this idler is the entangled pair system idler 
in some uh, entangled state, this is re replaced with a parameterized quantum circuit uh, preparation. And then uh, a row B is a thermal bath. And then uh, U is basically this beam splitter transformation. And then once you get this uh, 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 state out, which is basically this uh, row SI, then you can perform an optimal uh, binary POVM uh, on this, which is again another parameterized quantum circuit, which I just showed you um, uh, in the previous okay. uh, diagram. Yeah. Uh, thank you. The second question is what type of channels uh, you are using, uh, for example, amplitude damping, depolarization, or unital? Yeah, so we make very we make very careful remarks in the paper. You can see, I, I invite you to look at it. So in principle, this is for all CPTP maps. But having said that, let me also make the uh, following, let me post the following warning and explain it to you. Um, if two CPTP maps are right next to each other, uh, actually discriminating them is very difficult. This is a well-known problem, basically. So what we, in the paper, what we give you is an information theoretic bound on how, uh, on how much parameterization is required in the quantum circuit for you to actually find two CPTP maps as a function of the diamond norm. So if the diamond norm is some D, how hard do you have to work in as a function of D for you to kind of get, uh, to be able to discriminate one from the other with some kind of known uh, um, error probability. And what we uh, basically point out is that that thing uh, actually prevents us from running up against known complexity theoretic results in the, in the field. So there are known complexity theoretic results which tell you that uh, CPTP map discrimination as a general, you know, isometry uh, detection, blah, 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 is actually quite a difficult problem in general. And so what we are basically saying is, even though that difficult, that general problem is difficult, quantum illumination is a problem that people are happy to invest a huge amount of money, right? I mean, Raytheon had a program for many years on this. And so, um, you know, as an application, there are, uh, you know, the worst case complexity argument is something that we are also compliant with. We fully agree with it. Uh, our uh, parameterized quantum circuit fails in a way that carefully accommodates this issue. But at the same time, um, uh, we also uh, point out that for useful cases, which are not the worst case, uh, we actually seem to be doing well enough. And, um, and so this is one of these cases of good enough for government work. So the Thank summary you. answer to your, uh, to your question is, it applies in principle to all CP maps. Uh, in, the, uh, in, the append in this appendix of the paper, uh, we've analyzed uh, uh, um, uh, phase damping maps, and then we've analyzed some unitary maps. Um, in the main paper, we've, uh, uh, we've done this map that I've shown you. Um, and maybe there's one more example that I'm forgetting. And then there is the overarching, overarching kind of complexity theory. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Shai. I mean, do you have any other question? Maybe we can take one quickly if there are. No. Okay. Shai, we do thank you for.